It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my first question is for the Premier. Last Friday, a woman named Christine visited Queen's Park to talk about the minimum wage. She works four different jobs, all of them paying the minimum wage. Even working four jobs, she finds it hard to make ends meet. Raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour would make a big difference in her life. Does the Premier think she deserves a raise? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, and the Leader of the Opposition, everywhere I go, no matter if it's the small businesses, medium businesses, or large businesses, they tell me that Bill 148 is a failed Liberal policy that is driving jobs and investment out of Ontario. Yep. Our Minister of Economic Development is reviewing Bill 148, holding roundtables with stakeholders and investors to determine the best way to move forward. I'll tell you, Bill 148 is the worst bill for the frontline, hardworking people this province has ever seen. It is worse than the carbon tax. Matter of fact, it's equal to the carbon tax when it comes to job killing. TD Economics predicts that Bill 148 will result in 80 to 90,000 jobs lost on top of the thousands and thousands of jobs that have already been lost. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, it's my understanding that the Premier is visiting Alberta on Friday, and he might want to note that Alberta's NDP government just raised their minimum wage to $15 an hour. And more importantly, or as importantly, they're gaining jobs. 16,000 jobs they gained in August, where this government lost 81,000 jobs. They're leading the country Order. in GDP growth, Speaker, so he should learn those facts when he goes there. But one of the realities is that Christine is one of thousands of people who are struggling to get by on two or more minimum wage jobs, and she's scheduled to get a raise in January. If the Premier thinks that's too soon for Christine to get a raise, how long does he think she should have to wait to get one? Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker and Leader of the Opposition, we're actually protecting the minimum wage. We aren't touching the minimum wage. We're going to make sure we attract investment. And I can't wait to go out west and talk about the worst tax ever with Premier Mo in Saskatchewan about the carbon tax. And then I look forward to visiting our friend Jason Kenney out in Alberta. For you, Mr. Speaker, because Alberta has dropped so low, I predict Jason Kenney will sweep Alberta and bring proper reform in, create more great paying jobs like we are here in Ontario. This is about job creation. Yep. We said we're there for the people. Lots. We're going to continue representing the people by here, here. making sure we create an environment for great paying jobs. Start the clock. Sup final supplementary. Well, Speaker, the last time the Conservatives were in office, they protected the minimum wage and froze it for eight years right. running. For eight years right. running, they froze the minimum wage. And hardworking people suffered greatly under that regime. For but for Christine side. and thousands of other people struggling in tough jobs, the current minimum wage leaves them falling behind. As she put it, and I quote, you can't live in Toronto on, on that. Side. You can't live anywhere in Ontario on that. You just can't. I'd like to say that that's after taxes. This is still the quote. But the truth is, I don't earn enough to pay taxes. Eureka moment. A young woman make, earning four, on four jobs earning minimum wage does not earn enough to pay taxes. She looks, she's looking forward to that raise, Speaker. Why does the Premier think that she doesn't deserve one? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, if the Leader of the Opposition would like to sit down at the round table with my minister 
and listen to the job creators. Listen to the small businesses. Listen to the medium and large businesses. That Bill 148 is a job killer. We're going to protect the minimum wage. We're going to protect the frontline workers by lowering their hydro rates, by lowering their gas gas by 10 cents a litre, yep. making sure that we thrive in Ontario. Yep. We have seen 300,000 jobs leave Ontario. Bye -bye. Uh, the biggest concern, Ohio is terrified, Michigan is terrified, and so is New York State, because we're going to be more competitive than all the states that we've lost the 300,000 jobs. Open for business. Just take their seats. Order. Question, Leader of the Opposition. Well, thank you, Speaker. My next question is also to the Premier. You know, the law in Ontario allows working people to take up to two paid sick days when they are ill. Does the Premier think Christine and working women and men like her should be able to take a paid sick day when they're ill, or is that a benefit that he plans to take away? Premier. For you, Mr. Speaker, we're going to send a clear message to the world that Ontario is open for yeah. business. Attractive incentives for businesses to come to Ontario because we will be competitive. We'll create thousands and tens of thousands of jobs. Yep. Mr. Speaker, I'll never forget when I went to Renfrew, Minister of Transportation, John Yakubuski, and I saw 20 people, 20 people with disabilities come up to me and say, Doug, I lost my job because of Bill 148. Yep. These are Everywhere. young people and young adults with autism that thousands across the province lost their job because of Bill 148. Coming Students back. lost their jobs because of Bill 148. Yep. We're going to create jobs. We're going to make sure we hire students, yep. hire people with special needs. We're going to support the frontline workers of this province. We'll make sure that Take Start the clock. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, it's really taking the province backwards when a, when a premier believes that open for business means being punitive to workers. That's I think right. you can have both. I think you can have a province that, that is open for uh, investment and uh, and business, but at the same time treats its workers with dignity and respect. That's right. The law in Ontario allows working people to take leave to care for family members in an emergency without losing their job. Does the Premier think Christine should be able to care for a sick family member in an emergency and still keep her job, or is that a protection that he plans on taking away? Premier. For you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to remind the Leader of the Opposition there's 385,000 regulations yep. here in Ontario. Yep. Those are job killers. Yep. We have a roundtable put together, and I encourage the Leader of the Opposition, rather than penalize companies, small companies, medium and large companies, why doesn't the Leader of the Opposition sit around the table? The red tape, we're going to cut the red tape, we're going to cut the regulations, Bring we're going to make sure we make Ontario open for business. Here, here. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, I've been talking about sick days, I've been talking about emergency leave, and I certainly haven't heard the Premier once stand up for everyday working people yep. and say they deserve a fair shake in the province of Ontario. Too many people, too many people. Too many people in this province are falling behind, and they fell behind when the Conservatives were in office and froze the minimum wage for eight years. They fell behind for 15 years the Liberal government raising the wage to $15 an hour in our province, allowing people to take a sick day and care for loved ones, are always, uh, or, or always uh, to ensure that hardworking people can pay the bills, can pay the rent, to see our ways, rather, uh, to make sure that people can pay pay the rent, pay the bills, see their families. These are things that we would expect any worker should be able to enjoy. This is not Victorian England, Speaker. This is, uh, this is the province of Ontario in 2018. Why is the Premier opposed to things like a $15 minimum wage, paid time off when you're sick, and making sure people can take an emergency day off when their family needs them? Premier. 
Through you, Mr. Speaker, I just want to remind the Leader of the Opposition of the Ray days, the NDP days, <laughs> where people, where hundreds of thousands of people, 700,000 people lost their jobs. They increased our debt by $60 billion. That was the beginning of the end of the NDP. We saw the five years of destruction under the NDP. We're turning the corner. We're going to be the most prosperous province in the country. We will thrive with opportunity and prosperity, the likes of which this province has never seen. Please take your seats. Next question, Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. Almost a year ago today, the Health Minister for the Liberal government proudly announced that they would be investing $100 million to, keep uh, to help hospitals deal with crowded hallways during the flu season. A year later, patients are still stacked in hallways, but it's a Conservative government making the same empty announcement. Wow. Patients languishing in hospital hallways expect real action. Why is the government offering Liberal Band-Aid funding, repackaged as conserv a Conservative plan, instead of doing something tangible to end hallway medicine for yeah. good. Minister of Health. Premier, Minister of Health. Well, as the leader of the official opposition knows, one of our primary campaign commitments was to end hallway health care. We are working on that each and every day. We also have an advisory council that is advising the Premier and me on ways that we can steps that we can take because it's a multifaceted problem. It involves uh, moving patients who are alternate level of care who don't need to be in hospital to appropriate places, long-term care homes. That was excuse me, another one of our major commitments, which we are also working on. It's also about developing a comprehensive mental health and addiction system so that people don't need to be in crisis and have to go to emergency departments, that they can receive care in a proactive way. We are working on both of those issues right now. We are investing more money into it, and we have a further announcement after after today. Uh, we will have an announcement Response. that we will be making with respect to that specific issue. Supplementary. I may be incorrect, Speaker, but I think what the minister was acknowledging is that the $90 million is not for hallway medicine. Patients who need care are left sometimes for days in hospital hallways. I saw this myself when I visited Thunder Bay Regional Health Centre, uh, where they've been operating at surge capacity for years now. And instead of help, the Conservatives offered cuts to mental health funding, uh, to the opioid crisis, all of which forced people, guess where, Speaker, back Order into on the, government the emergency packages. rooms. Does does the Premier really believe that warming up the same tired Liberal plan is going to make a difference for patients stuck in hallways in hospitals? Minister of Health. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And through you, Speaker, to the Leader of the Official Opposition, you are not correct with what you just stated. We are investing our money. We are investing money into our mental health and addiction system, which is an increase. $3.8 billion over 10 years is a major increase, and it's going to be a comprehensive and coordinated system to get people the help that they need. But we also do recognize that with flu season upcoming, a lot of the hospitals that are already at 100 per cent capacity are going to face additional stresses and strains. We have dealt with that, we have a plan with that, and we will be announcing that later today. So I hope you will be listening to that announcement. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Kitchener South Hespler. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. The constituents in my riding follow the free trade negotiations between Canada, the United States, and Mexico closely. Hundreds of thousands of jobs across Ontario depend on free and fair trade with our largest trading partner. Nearly 9 million American jobs depend on Canada, U.S. trade and investment, and approximately 400,000 people and $2 billion in trade every day travel across our border. Continued uncertainty for our dairy farmers and steel producers is of great concern to our Premier and to myself and the people in my riding. 
Can the minister please inform the legislature how our government for the people is protecting job creators like Toyota in Kitchener South Hespeler? Minister of Economic Development. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my honourable colleague uh, for the very good question. And like uh, the member for Kitchener South uh, Hespeler, I was fortunate enough to uh, tour with her this summer. Uh, the, uh, and met with uh, the, the Toyota plant in her riding and met with the workers and the management. And uh, we were very much uh, impressed with the work that they do, the cars they produce. They've won many international awards. In fact, I think one of the companies in, 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 in the world that's won so many awards in the automotive sector. And the uh, workers really asked us to look after their jobs and protect their jobs. And that's exactly what our government for the people has been doing. We do that every single day. More recently, more recently, we're disappointed the federal government hasn't, hasn't uh, been able to uh, get the tariffs taken off of steel and aluminum. That's starting to affect companies Response. like Toyota. So there's more work to be done, and Premier Ford will be there. I'll be there. I know the honourable member will be there. We will protect those jobs and stand up for Ontario workers. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his response. I appreciate the work our government is doing to protect the auto industry and, by extension, the Toyota plant in my riding. I was certainly honoured to tour that facility this summer with Minister Wilson, Parliamentary Assistant Skelly and MPP for Cambridge, Cara Halios. Parliamentary Assistant Skelly has also been speaking to businesses large and small and workers across the province, including in my riding, on trade relations between Canada, the U.S. and Mexico. After 13 months of uncertainty surrounding free trade with the United States and Mexico, it is positive to see a deal and to know that our government stood up for the people every step of the way. Can the minister please inform the legislature what work is left to be done? Minister. Thank you, uh, thank you colleague and, and, and speaker. In, indeed, uh, you know, we have mixed reviews on the, uh, on the uh, new NAFTA. Uh, on the one hand, uh, as the honourable member uh, said, it, it's good news that they settled the uh, threat of tariffs, of future tariffs on, on auto and auto parts. It's a special section to protect uh, us against 232, uh, should the U.S. ever decide to do that. They can't do it under NAFTA. However, the 1962 law uh, on national security allows them to continue to do, in spite of NAFTA, to continue to put punitive tariffs on steel and aluminum, they're there today, and on any other commodities uh, services uh, that they may want in the future, and the heck with NAFTA. So the federal government left a NAFTA that you can drive a truck through, hopefully a Toyota truck, right through, um, uh, because these 232 tariffs. So what work is left to do? They have to get back to the table before they sign this deal at the end of November and look after those punitive tariffs. Thank you. Members, will take your seats. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, for years now, hospitals throughout our province have been operating at overcapacity. That means that every night there are thousands of Ontarians, patients that are crammed into bathroom, shower room, TV room, storage closet, anywhere you can fit a bed or a stretcher. In Sudbury, Health Sciences North is presently at overcapacity, and they are expecting a surge with the flu season just around the corner. The Ontario Hospital Association tells us that they need a minimum of $300 million just to maintain what we have, not to fix it. Does the minister believe that $90 million shared between 150 hospitals will fix hallway medicine in Sudbury and prepare them to care for us? when the flu season surge starts. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, I thank the, the member very much for the question. The fact is we are aware that many hospitals across Ontario are operating at over 100 per cent capacity, and this puts good patient care in jeopardy with the flu season approaching. And any one patient that's being treated in a hallway is one patient too many, as far as I'm concerned. They deserve better. Many are seniors. They deserve to be treated in a proper hospital room. And for healthcare professionals that are attending for them, that is not the kind of care that they want to provide either. So we have anticipated the flu season. We are providing relief 
um, across Ontario. We are injecting $90 million into it, but there's more than that. We will be making an announcement about that shortly after noon today. So should you have any questions following that, I would be very pleased to answer them. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Thunderbury Regional Hospital, like so many other hospitals, has been operating at overcapacity. Last January, they had 447 patients in 375 beds. Strong in math, Speaker, that's 72 patients who were cared for in corridors, bathroom, TV lounge, anywhere but a hospital room. The situation in Thunder Bay is still very dire. As they continue to provide quality care while trying to provide quality care while providing hallway medicine. Let me be clear, Speaker, you cannot provide quality care in a hallway. It is not possible. Does the minister think that investing a thousand beds among 150 hospitals will fix the hallway medicine crisis in Thunder Bay and will prepare them for the surge with the flu around the corner? Minister. Well, I, I would say to the member that this is a situation that has been growing over a number of years. This didn't just happen after June 7th. It's been growing for 15 years. So we need to deal with that. And there's not going to be one simple solution that's going to come forward that we're going to be able to instantly end hallway medicine. I agree with you. No one deserves to be treated in a hallway or a storage room. We are taking steps to deal with it. It is a multifaceted problem. It does involve people that are ending up in emergency departments but can't get to a room because of the alternate level of care patients who don't need to be in hospital but can't go home, they can't get enough services, and there's no long-term care home to go to for them. So we have to build in steps along the way to make sure that patients get the care that they need. We are working on it. Are the steps that we're going to take today going to end Response. hallway health care? No, unfortunately not. We are working on a long-term health capacity plan that we will be working on and bringing forward over the next few months. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Our government, for the people, is committed to creating and protecting Ontario jobs by sending the message that Ontario is open for business. After 15 years of failed Liberal policies and a radical NDP that voted for the formal government 97 per cent of the time, Ontarians on June 7 voted for relief. Well, relief is here. Could the minister please inform the legislature of the details surrounding Spotify's recent investment announcement in Ontario? Hey, hey. Minister of Economic Development. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank you to the honourable member for Etobicoke Lakeshore for the question. Yeah, we was pleased. Our government was pleased. Uh, uh, Shopify's uh, recent announcement. Uh, I was pleased to tour Shopify this summer when I was in Ottawa, and last week Shopify announced its plan to invest up to half a billion dollars in a new Toronto office. This office will be home to thousands of new employees. Here, here. Our government for the people is thrilled this expansion is taking place right here in Ontario. You know, Shopify had the world to look at, Mr. Speaker, and they chose Ontario and they made that decision after we came to office on June 7th and a series of meetings that, that we had. So we are very, very, very pleased that uh, Shopify has got the message that Ontario is open for business. And in the supplementary, I'll mention some other companies that got the message that Ontario is open for business. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response and for all the great work you are doing to getting our economy in Ontario moving once again. Here, here. Every day over the last many years, I have heard in the riding of Etobicoke Lakeshore and all across this province that life under the previous Liberal government has gotten far too expensive. Wow. That is why our government for the people is cleaning up the hydro mess consulting with businesses on red tape and lowering taxes. Can the minister inform the legislature of recent investments in Ontario? Mr. Mr. Uh, Member, um, I should note that Shopify is making this half a billion dollar investment in Ontario without a government handout, Mr. Speaker. Those days are over. They're doing it 
They're doing it because they have our assurances, they have the assurances of the and the word of the Premier of Ontario and all of our caucus on the PC side that we are going to cut red tape, we are going to make the regulatory environment easy for businesses to create jobs, and Ontario is open for business. And all that entails, including Bill 148, I say to the people on the other side. As I've already mentioned this legislature, Mr. Speaker, Amazon and Instacart have both recently announced major investments across Ontario. CBS Television Studios just this week announced it will open a 2,600 a uh, thousand square foot production hub in Mississauga, an APAG Electronic and Automotive Electronics and Lighting Company is setting up it had, its headquarters in Windsor, creating 148 jobs. Together, these announcements means thousands Spons. of new jobs, good paying jobs across Ontario. And Mr. Speaker, jobs are our number one priority, and we're not going to give up until everybody that can work in this province has a job. <laughs> Start the clock. Next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. The Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Speaker, last week the Auditor General released a special report on the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority. The report shows the NPCA is having difficulty fulfilling its mandate. It is plagued by financial mismanagement, a high employee grievance rate, and conflict of interest issues. We've seen the NPCA fire key staff, censure board members, lobby the government to develop on pro provincially significant wetlands, and even sue a private citizen. The Auditor General herself recommended that the province could do more to oversee the MPCA. Will the minister hold the MPCA accountable and appoint a supervisor to oversee the implementation of the Auditor General's recommendations? Okay. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Um, Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for his question. The, uh, as, as not everybody may know, the Standing Committee on Public Accounts um, asked the Auditor General to uh, look into the uh, NPCA as a result of some concerns that were raised. Uh, that report was delivered last week by the Auditor. I do want to make sure that we thank the Auditor for her recommendations. They were a very balanced set of recommendations, and, um, and we have reviewed them and are going to be working with municipalities to uh, see where we can support conservation authorities better in terms of the governance uh, of those authorities and how we work with them to make sure they have the resources involved. I should say, Mr. Speaker, that we are assured both by the Auditor's uh, reporting and her review as well as the other the work we've done, that this does not ref the concerns that were raised in Niagara are not concerns we have for all conservation authorities. But be assured, we take this uh, we take the report very seriously. We'll be we have reviewed the recommendations and we'll be working with municipalities, including the area, to support the conservation authorities. Supplementary. Thank you for the response, Minister. Former MPP Cindy Forrester has asked the previous government to intervene in the issue of the MPCA since 2014. Conservation authorities are created to advocate for conservation in order to maintain the balance between the environment and development. Speaker, the MPCA continue, continuously advocates for the latter. One of the most troubling findings in the audit is that the MPCA is not responding to local complaints when the Conservation Act is violated. It's clear we need a supervisor, a clean sweep of the board, and changes to the Conservation Act to ensure that at least 50 per cent of the board are community members with a working knowledge of conservation. To the minister, is he prepared to make these changes and work with local area MPPs to implement the Auditor General's recommendations? Minister. Mr. Speaker, and through you to the member, to be clear, the Auditor General's recommendation was that there needs to be uh, work done. Uh, the, I was pleased to see that the uh, Conservation Authority in question did embrace the recommendations and has, has agreed to and is already implementing a number of them. Um, there are interesting issues raised by the Auditor General with regards to governance, um, in particular the uh, role of board members vis-a-vis -vis their municipality and the Conservation Authority and how they need to approach that in the future. So we are looking closely at, at those items and will ensure that we work with municipalities to make sure that the 36 conservation authorities across the province are well managed and governed. Next question, the member for Guelph. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll direct my question to the Minister of Economic Development. Minister, I think your government is making a false choice between supporting small businesses and minimum wage workers. Raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour makes life more affordable 
for families and provides them with more money to spend in the local economy supporting local businesses and lowering payroll taxes on small businesses provides them with immediate cash flow relief to create more jobs and to pay higher wages. So I asked the minister if the government will support local job creation by committing to lowering payroll taxes on small businesses by doubling the employer health tax exemption and at the same time raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour on January 1st. Minister of Economic Development. Well, thank you uh, to the Leader of the Green Party for the, for the question. Um, we just had uh, the most significant lowering of payroll taxes in my 28 years here with a $1.45 billion ejection into businesses, particularly small businesses, with the decrease in the premiums of the WSIB. That's the largest investment I've seen in job creation in years. The books are balanced now at WSIB. So premiums can come down. I think Minister Labour tells us an average of 30 percent, some sectors much higher than that. That's fantastic news. And as part of our initiative of Ontario is Open for Business, I know that our hardworking finance minister, Mr. Fidelli, is looking at every tax we have and every burden we bring in, as I'm doing, as my parliamentary assistant, Mike Parsa, is doing, to make life easier for small and medium-sized businesses. The greatest dignity we can give a human being is the opportunity for a job. That's what we believe in. I believe your party believes that. Stand with us to create jobs and not lose jobs like we saw under the previous Liberal government. Order. Order. House will come to order. Minister of Transportation will come to order. I can hear you. Start the clock. Supplementary. Minister, the Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses for years has been calling for lowering payroll taxes on small businesses by increasing the exemption level for the employer health tax. At the same time, raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour will put an additional $2,000 in the pockets of minimum wage families. Both of these policies provide more money for small businesses to create jobs and more money for local workers to spend with small businesses and local economies. So I ask again, will this go through you, Mr. Speaker, to the minister, will this government support minimum wage workers by raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour while supporting Order. small businesses at the same time by lowering their payroll taxes? Minister. Uh, minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you for the question. You know, everything that we have done is for the people. We are bringing relief for families. We are returning prosperity to the people of Ontario. As Minister Wilson said, we're open for business. A billion and a half dollars back into businesses to reinvest through the WSIB. Scrapping the cap and trade, putting $285 back in the families. Lowering the gas by 4.3 cents on its way to 10 cents a litre. Lowering corporate tax rates from 11.5% to 10.5% so those businesses can, re can hire again. Lowering the small business tax rate by 8.75%. 20% tax cut for middle income families. Hydro rates going down 12%. Getting out of costly wind and solar projects. Saving $790 million Spons? over 16 years. That is all about bringing real, real relief to families. Speaker, thank you. Order. Start the clock. The member for Mississauga Centre. This week, we learned that for the third time in history, a woman was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics. That, that woman is Canadian-born Dr. Donna Strickland. From Guelph, Ontario, Dr. Strickland is an associate professor of physics and astronomy at the University of Waterloo. Her work has mostly been focused in the laser physics field. 
Alongside her colleague, Dr. Moreau from France, she developed technology known as chirped pulse amplification. This work has led to a number of inventions that we are all familiar with, such as laser eye surgery. Mr. Speaker, Dr. Strickland is a testament to the potential of her students and girls right here in Ontario. Can the Minister of Education tell us what our government is doing to ensure that Ontario students will continue to be global leaders in subjects like math, science, and technology? Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Mississauga Centre. She herself is a wonderful role model for girls and women throughout Ontario. Here, here, and here. I'm proud to stand up on behalf of the Premier, the PC government, and as Minister of Education to recognize and congratulate Dr. Strickland for her incredible achievement. You know, as we heard earlier today, October 11th is National Day of Girls, and it's important that we recognize her role models. Her success is also a tribute to the caliber of academics we need right here in Ontario. And since day one, it's the PC government that has been committed to providing that quality of education. In today's world, our needs are constantly evolving, and it's important that we provide world-class education fields like STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And you know, yeah, we've already one -on -one. started by scrapping discovery math, a failed method of teaching that only left our students Bad. behind. In Ontario, we have some Bad. of the best teachers in the world, but it's up to the government to set the baseline for what students should be learning, and we're doing Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. To the minister, thank you for that response, and thank you for all the hard work that you are doing to ensure that our students succeed today and tomorrow. Right. I am happy to hear about how important teachers are to this province. Many of my good friends chose teaching as their vocation, and I am so proud of the work that they do in inspiring students to reach their full potential. I am equally as pleased to see that as part of the education consultations, parents can tell the government about a teacher who has gone above and beyond to support their child's learning. However, Mr. Speaker, parents in my riding have also expressed their interest in doing more to ensure their child is prepared for the future, especially when it comes to skills in subjects like math, science, and technology. I think we can all agree that parents, guardians, and Question. student support systems are the most important partners that we have in education. Can the minister explain how the government will continue to involve parents in their child's education? Minister. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. There is no doubt that in order to prepare our students for the future, we need to support students starting right here yeah, within here. our homes across Ontario. Our approach is a simple one. It's all about getting back to the basics. We've provided parents with a fact sheet so that they can be engaged as well, outlining learning expectations when it comes specifically to mathematics. This fact sheet suggests how parents can involve their parents and children in everyday opportunities to learn the fundamentals about math. Whether it be at school or at home, there's always an opportunity to engage children in mathematic fundamentals. Our government believes it's attitude and plans for the education of our children that will prepare our students for success like Dr. Strickland's. Mr. Speaker, I would like to remind every member in this House that our education cons consultations are now open. We're welcoming written submissions. And we're, encouraging, ever. we're encouraging all parents, teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Next question. Member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Economic Development and Trade. Speaker, yesterday we heard a lot of talk from that side of the House on what the federal government needs to do to support our dairy farmers in the wake of the renegotiated NAFTA agreement. But what we didn't hear was what this government is prepared to do and going to do to help farm families that have been hurt by this deal. This government talks a big game about supporting our farmers. Well, here is your chance to actually prove it. Will the minister step up to the plate and support our farm families if federal support is not forthcoming? Minister of Economic Development. Uh, minister of Agriculture and Food and Rural Affairs. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I thank the member for the question. And obviously, it's a grave concern uh, with us about uh, the impact that this trade agreement will have on our farming communities. Obviously, the farmers are the bedrock of our of our communities, and when one sector of the economy in rural Ontario is hurting, the whole community is hurting. So we want to make sure we put. As we started this process, we uh, we had a federal government that said they were going to stand with them, um, protecting our supply managed sector in our um, in our society. We said we would stand shoulder to shoulder with them. That they've let us down here. They've also now said that they are going to make us whole by presenting a, a, pay, a package, a funding package that will in fact um, cover the cost of what this trade agreement, the impact this trade agreement will have on our rural communities, and we will Response. hold their feet to the fire. The Trudeau government has a responsibility to live up to the actions of the cost of their actions. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, with all due respect, Speaker, uh, the uh, members of the opposition don't have the same blind faith in Justin Trudeau to come to the rescue as the Minister of Agriculture does. <laughs> Speaker, uh, the question is back to the Minister of, of, uh, Minister of Economic Development. If the government is not going to get, do anything to help support our farm families, maybe they'll do something for our steel and aluminum industries. Yes. The steel and aluminum tariffs uh, have been in place since June the 1st. Our other provinces have stepped up and offered support for their producers, but Ontario so far has done absolutely nothing. Will the minister commit today? To developing a support package for Ontario steel and aluminum producers now that we know that those, those tariffs will continue to be in place. It's gone to the Minister of Agriculture and Food. Uh, refer it to the Minister. You can refer it back. <laughs> refer it back to the Minister of Economic Development. Well, thank you. And I just say to the honourable uh, member across the way, ye of little faith. Yep. Uh, we. Uh, we uh, well, the Prime Minister has put forward $2 billion to offset the damage that's been done uh, with U.S. tariffs on steel and aluminum. And, uh, you know, the premise of the question that Ontario doesn't do anything, I, this government, moments after we got the text of the agreement on Sunday night and all Monday, were the only ones in Canada saying, hey, he's left this out to dry on dairy. It took days, it took a couple of days before other people stood up. And we pointed out the, 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 the truck Order. that you can drive through NAFTA, which are these punitive tariffs, beginning with steel and aluminum, and God knows what else they feel like doing in the United States to hurt our economy, to drive jobs to their economy. Response. We're the ones standing up for jobs in Ontario and, in fact, for jobs in Canada. Stop. Order. <laughs> Member for Timmins, come to order. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Mississauga Streetsville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. I, like many of my colleagues in this House, have had requests for assistance from individuals who have come to Canada through proper immigration channels to work in fields where we have a shortage of skilled trades. We welcome people who want to work hard and contribute positively to our economy. As a prime example of how the federal immigration system is ineffective, an individual case caught my attention. This individual went through the legitimate application process and obtained a work visa. Unfortunately, through a minor clerical error, this individual and his family will be deported this Friday. As a result, we are told that Immigration Ontario cannot assist with his claim, but must be referred to the federal level. Question. Mr. Speaker, what is Ontario doing to help legitimate immigrant claimant issues? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate the member opposite, or the member's uh, question uh, from our side of the House. Uh, as I previously mentioned on this matter, Ontarians are quickly losing faith with the federal government's ability to handle issues at the border, our immigration process, and the refugee process. I'll remind this House that the federal government has sole jurisdiction 
over border security and refugee claimants. And as a result of that, that's why we're calling as a part of this, uh, this government for the federal government to pay $200 million and growing as a result of the pressures on our social assistance costs, temporary shelters in our two largest cities, $20 million in growing in education costs, as well as additional costs with respect to legal aid, child welfare, and Spons. the Red Cross. So I will simply continue to call on the federal Liberals to fix their flawed system so that legitimate claimants will have a shot at actually getting in. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. I'd like to describe this situation a little further. Minister, this individual came to Canada with his family on a work visa, and as a result, the individual and his family wished to stay. He withdrew his original application and reapplied to the Ontario Immigrant Nominee Program, but realized that he had applied to the incorrect job. We have a federal government who ignore their responsibility for those crossing at illegal points of entry, but throw the book at you for checking off the wrong box on an application form. Will the minister stand up for skilled newcomers looking to make Ontario home and urge the federal government to take responsibility for their policies that have led to illegal border crosses? Minister. I, I very much appreciate that question. And uh, almost immediately after becoming the minister responsible for immigration, uh, it did two things. One is to, uh, to hold the federal Liberals to account on the escalating costs that we have seen as a province, which is $200 million in growing. Uh, the second thing is we've requested and we are going to hopefully receive more additional economic immigrants so we can work with the Minister of Economic Development and Trade to ensure that there are more skilled workers coming into Canada as a result of that program. But let me be perfectly clear, we have a broken border. Uh, Canadians, particularly Ontarians, are losing confidence in the federal government's ability to manage the illegal border crosser issue in the province of Quebec that is having a, a, a very big impact on us in our province. So I just want to be very clear. There, there are people right now that are on welfare rolls in Ontario that could be there for up to two years and then deported. We are calling on the federal government to fix the, the, the claims Spons. process with refugees, and I'm not the only one because I'm going to read with John McKay, a federal Liberal MPP, MP, that says the only fair thing to do for everybody is to process them quickly, and I think that's where the government's weakness is. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. On Friday, the minister received an open letter signed by 18 health care leaders across Ontario urging her to take immediate action and open more overdose prevention sites. One of the signatories is the Windsor-Essex Community Health Centre. The letter states, and I quote, since supervised consumption services and overdose prevention sites began opening in mid-2017, they've already saved 917 lives by reversing overdoses. That's 917 families who didn't receive the worst news possible. That's 917 people who still have a chance to build a better life." End quote. Will the minister listen to these experts? Will she open more life-saving sites? Minister of Health, long-term care. Well, thank you to the member very much for the question because every loss of life is tragic and we have lost too many lives in Ontario, so I do take this very seriously, as does everyone, I'm sure, in this House. And so that is what I have been listening to for the last several months. I have been listening to the people who are the experts, the people who run the supervised consumption sites and overdose prevention sites, people with lived experience, neighbours, community centres, and so on. I have been speaking to all of the people that want to have something to say on this issue. I am in the process. You, you are no doubt aware that we have applied to Health Canada in order to have the exemption extended for another six months while I finalize my recommendations to the Premier, which will be finalized very shortly. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. Windsor continues to struggle with rising poverty. One in four children now grow up in low-income households. Our community has also been hit particularly hard by the opioid crisis. So much so that local harm reduction workers and advocates are planning to open an unsanctioned overdose prevention site because they just can't wait any longer for this Conservative government to step up to the plate while members of our community die needlessly. But 
Opening this site means that they are risking criminal prosecution. Is this government really comfortable with harm reduction workers and advocates being treated like criminals just because they're trying to save lives? Minister of Health. There is no doubt that this is a very serious issue and one that we have been dealing with for several months. I know that everyone wants an answer right away, but the Premier has indicated that he wants to make a proper evidence-based decision, and I don't think anyone in this House would disagree Order. with that. So that is what I've been studying. That is what I'm going to be recommending to the Premier. And of course, there, besides, saving lives is, of course, very important. But the other part of it is also very important, that you want to be able to help people get into treatment and rehabilitation so they can help improve their lives. You have to do both. Both are very important. But that is part of the recommendations I am going to be making to the Premier to discuss these situations, and he will be making a final determination. We are working with his office right now, and there will be a decision and announcement to be made in very short order. Thank you. Next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. As we celebrate Ontario's 20th Agriculture Week, I'm reminded of farmers in my riding of Carleton, farmers like Graham Green and Janet Aker Smiley, and all they do to put food on Ontario's tables. However, it's also been a tough week. The USMCA will result in significant market access being given to the U.S. at the expense of Ontario's farmers. It's disappointing that our federal counterparts have created this uncertainty for our agriculture industry. Last week, our Premier and Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade went to Washington, sending a strong message that Ontario's farmers remain top of mind. Mr. Speaker, through you, Question. what will the minister do to ensure the federal government will keep the concerns of Ontario's farmers top of mind? Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much to the member for the question. Our farmers are the bedrock of our community, and we are reminded of their contributions during Ontario's 20th Agriculture Week. Indeed, it's been a rough start for the week for our supply-managed sector following the USMCA. However, the Premier and I have taken immediate action to do everything in our power to help our farmers. We have met with our supply managed stakeholders to assure them that we are calling on the federal government to compensate our farmers for their losses. The federal minister Freeland has mentioned our farmers will be compensated fully, fairly, and for the concessions that they've made, and we will hold them to account for that. Protecting our farmers ensures that our food is protected safe and of the best quality. Our government is committed to working with our farmers Spons. as we continue to review the USMCA. Thank you very much for your Supplementary. Thank you to the minister for that answer. I'm proud to be part of a government that stands up for its farmers and appreciates their contributions to our communities. I look forward to working with our government to ensure we can assist Ontario's farmers to the best of our abilities and to urge the Trudeau liber Liberals to keep Ontario's farmers top of mind. Mr. Speaker, back to the minister. Can the minister please tell us what else he is doing to uh, what else he is going to do to create an environment that is supportive and open for business for our farmers? Minister. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the supplementary question. I also wanted to thank all the caucus members yesterday who took time to visit and take pictures of our tractors on the south driveway yesterday in celebrating Ontario Agriculture Week. Mr. Speaker, as mentioned before, our government is committed to standing up for our farmers. As we continue to review the USMCA, we will work with our farmers and urge the federal government to compensate them accordingly. Our natural gas expansion plan, if passed, will put more money into the pockets of farming families and businesses so they can continue to provide for more of the best quality food. Our plan to scrap the cap-and-trade carbon tax will also do the same, if passed, to put more money back into the pockets of taxpayers. We're cutting red tape and regulations as seen first through our changes to our wildlife damage compensation program. 
with more announcements to follow. On June Spons. the 8th, our government was elected to make Ontario open for business again. We have taken immediate action to make life more affordable and efficient for our farming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next, stop the clock. Start the clock. The next question, member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Four years ago, Maureen Trask, uh, a parent, came to me looking for help to find her missing son, Daniel. After countless petitions to this House and a motion calling for missing persons legislation, Ontario's first Missing Persons Act was passed this past spring. I want to thank Maureen uh, for her advocacy. She turned her grief into action in this province. But because it is part of the Safer Ontario Act, it's on hold. This government has put that act on a pause. Can the minister provide an update as to when the Missing Persons Act will come into effect in the province of Ontario? Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you for the question. Uh, and and uh, forgive me the opportunity also to, uh, to give an update. I'd like to begin by stating the, that, in fact, my staff has already been instructed to begin the work on developing the necessary regulations to bring the Missing Persons Act to life. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> Mr. Speaker the Missing Persons Act, once in force, will address a current barrier faced by police in Ontario when investigating missing persons occurrences by providing police with tools to use in circumstances where there is no evidence a crime has been committed. The Missing Persons Act will allow police to apply for judicial orders to access records, such as information about travel or telephone and other electronic communications, or to authorize entry into premises to search Spons. for a missing person. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And it's good to hear that the ministry is working on the regulations, but the act needs to be brought to this legislature in order for those regulations to be put into action. Maureen is one of the strongest advocates for the Missing Persons Act, and Ontario is one of the only provinces that does not have this legislation. Uh, Maureen was briefed by ministry staff on the legislation development, but because it was her family's experience, losing Daniel drove the creation of this act in the province of Ontario. Yet, since the election, that communication has unfortunately broken down. Speaker, after Maureen's tireless advocacy, the government owes it to her and to people across this province to provide an answer and to bring the legislation back into this House. What is the status of the Missing Persons Act coming back to the Ontario Legislature so that we can have this act in the province? Response, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you once again for that uh, question. I'd like to repeat that my ministry takes this matter very seriously, and my staff has already been instructed to begin development of the necessary regulations to bring the Missing Persons Act to life. The Missing Persons Act will provide the men and women of our police services with the tools necessary to more effectively conduct investigations into matters regarding missing persons. Thank you. Next question, the member for Burlington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Seniors and Accessibility. I learned yesterday that we honoured honored seniors from across the province on National Seniors Day. Can the minister share with this House why seniors, like myself, are important to this government? Minister responsible for seniors. Minister responsible for seniors. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, through you, I'd like to thank the hardworking MPP from Burlington. We love her. She's yes. great. I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to Monday's celebration and why acknowledging the contribution of seniors was important to me and worthy of our collective support. Our seniors are the foundation of our society, sure this are. province, and this great nation, Canada. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we owe a great deal to the women and men 
who helped build our province here, here. and our country. Here, here. Here, here. Right now, there are two million seniors in the province, and in 25 years, the number will double to four million. Wow. Wow. I want to clear. I want to be clear, Mr. Speaker. We intend to support them every step of the way. Here, here. Here. Seniors are living healthier, independent, and are more socially engaged, Mr. Speaker. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the minister. Can the minister let this house know just how this government intends to support the seniors of Ontario? Minister. Thank you for the practical question. Mr. Speaker, Premier Doug Ford and this government have the highest regard for Ontario's seniors. And treating them with respect will be at the heart of everything we do as a government. At the AMO conference last August, I met so many mayors and the councillors. They are working so hard to build the age-friendly initiative in their, in their municipality. I have att also attended many events, such as the recent Ontario Seniors Community Association conference in Alliston. Uh, I also visited two excellent senior living centres in Ottawa. Busy, Mr. Speaker, we reach out to Ontario Response. seniors through so many excellent, hardworking stakeholders who share our passion and commitment. Start the clock. Next question, the member for London North Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Mission Services, which operates London's Roth Home, Women's and Family Shelters in Crisis. The shelter is operating at 195 per cent capacity, with 20 families filling the shelter and another 19 spending their nights in motels. In July, we asked this government if they would open provincial and federally owned properties to deal with the unprecedented and alarming demand for housing. So to the minister, while this government blames the federal government and points fingers, what is actually being done now to help shelters continue to serve our most vulnerable? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Uh, thanks very much for the question. I very much appreciate it, particularly since today we will be celebrating marking International Day of the Girl later on this afternoon. Uh, I can tell you that violence against women is uh, something uh, uh, very important priority for me and I've been working within my ministry in order to figure out how we can build more shelter capacity and I will have more to say about that in the weeks to come. I do appreciate your question. I'm interested in learning more about your specific issue and so we'll have that conversation after question period uh, if that's okay with the, the member opposite. But I want to be very clear. It, it, it's really difficult for the member opposite to equate what's happening with the illegal border crossing and the asylum seekers that are filling up the shelter capacity in the City of Toronto and in the City of Ottawa, when at the same time we're trying to build capacity for women's shelters across the province. So I remain committed uh, as the as the uh, minister responsible for women, but also the minister responsible for community and social services, to Bonds. working with the member opposite. And we're going to continue to invest more money into this area. And I can say that in 2017-2018, we invested $160 million into this area. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. While I look forward to meeting with the minister, I'm concerned about the people who are not being served right now. Calling this a refugee crisis is calling it by a different name than what it actually is. There are people who are in crisis right now. You know, there are people who are homeless, and that answer does nothing for people who are homeless right now. Shelters like Rotholm need the government to step in immediately. You know, we've seen social assistance increases and social housing repair funding slashed by this government, all while misusing the word compassionate. We need something done now. We need the minister to step in today and deliver the relief that the people of London desperately need. Minister. Thanks very much, uh, Speaker. 
uh, again, I think the member opposite is confusing the situation that is happening in the City of Toronto and the City of Ottawa with what's happening in London. And I can tell you that, that, that the capacity that we have in our shelter systems ha uh, has, has been impacted significantly. And I would like the member opposite to join us in asking for the federal government to come to the table with $200 million so that, so that the people who are most vulnerable in my ministry, which are women escaping violence, which are women who are being trafficked, which are children yeah. at risk, children in care, and children in the, just, in the uh, justice system, and those Position who are, who are developmentally dis disabled, they deserve the funding, Mr. Speaker. I have no idea why the members opposite won't join Ontario's call. Every single premier in the province is Order. That concludes the time for question period today. Um, someone sent me a message indicating they wanted a point of order but didn't sign it. Someone wanted to correct their record. Is there a point of order? Okay. Well, the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. On a point of order, I'd like to collect my record. My memory was on my first election rather than on my most recent election. It should be the 7th of uh, June rather than the 8th. Members can correct their own record. We have a deferred vote on the amendment to Government Notice of Motion No. 9 relating to allocation of time on Bill 4 an act respecting the preparation of a climate change plan, providing for the wind down of the cap and trade program and repealing the Climate Change Mitigation and Low Carbon Economy Act 2016. Call in the members. This will be a five minute bell.
I would ask that members please take their seats. On October 2nd, Mr. Bisson moved an amendment to Government Notice of Motion No. 9 relating to the allocation of time on Bill 4. All those in favour of Mr. Bisson's motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Mr. Tab. Mr. Tab. Ms. Singh Brampton Centre. Ms. Singh Brampton Centre. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Sat. Ms. Sat. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Lindo. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Carpoche. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Styles. Ms. Styles. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Mrs. Stevens. Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gretzky. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Bourguin. Mr. Bourguin. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rokosovic. Mr. Rokosovic. Mr. Harden. Mr. Harden. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Schreiner. Mr. Schreiner. All those opposed to Mr. Bichon's motion will please rise one at a time. And be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Smith Bay Quinty. Mr. Smith Bay Quinty. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Bethlehem Falvey. Mr. Bethlehem Falvey. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Mulrooney. Ms. Mulrooney. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Mr. York. Mr. York. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Calandra. Mr. Calandra. Ms. Serma. Ms. Serma. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Skelly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Trianta Philopolis. Mrs. Trianta Philopolis. Mr. Sarkaria. Mr. Sarkaria. Mr. Ostrov. Mr. Ostrov. Ms. Midas. Ms. Midas. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Mr. Hilliard. Mr. Hilliard. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Kusindova. Ms. Kusindova. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Mrs. Carahalios. Mrs. Carahalios. Mrs. Fee. Mrs. Fee. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Cramp. Mr. Cramp. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mademoiselle Samar. Mademoiselle Samar. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Smith, Peterborough Court. Mr. Smith, Peterborough Court. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Canapati. Mr. Canapati. Mr. Rabikian. Mr. Rabikian. Mr. Bauma. Mr. Bauma. Mr. Anand. Mr. Anand. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Tenny Gasson. Mr. Tenny Gasson. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Babber. Mr. Babber. Mr. Sabau. Mr. Sabau. The ayes are 39, the nays are 70. The ayes being 39 and the nays being 70, I declare the motion lost. I am now required to put the question on the main motion. Mr. Bethlen Falvey has moved government notice of motion number nine relating to allocation of time on Bill 4, an act respecting the preparation of a climate change plan providing for the wind-down of the cap-and-trade program and repealing the Climate Change Mitigation and Low Carbon Economy Act 2016. Is it the pleasure of the House that the motion carry? Yeah. Some no's. All those in favour of the motion will please say aye. aye. All those opposed will please say nay. Yeah. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Call in the members. This will be another five-minute bell. First, no.
Once again, Mr. Bethlen Falvey has moved Government Notice of Motion Number 9 relating to allocation of time on Bill 4. All those in favour of the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Smith, 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 Mr.